I don't know about the rest of you, but I like stargazing on a dark night. It's a lot of fun, especially if you're in a part of the world where you can actually see what's up in the sky. I don't claim to be a big time astronomer. I, I actually don't even own a telescope. But there was a time though, when I was a lot more into stargazing than I am now. I had a telescope when I was a child. And the night sky in those days fascinated me. So I would take the telescope and I would look at the moon and I would look at the planets and I would look at the stars. And now that I've come to learn a little more about astronomy over the course of my life, I've come to understand that some of the stars that I was looking at aren't actually stars. They're planets or they're galaxies that happen to appear in the night sky. The night sky is a fascinating thing if you take time to look at it. Matter of fact, I think I can say without any doubt that it was learning about the universe that was at least a part of the process of coming to faith for me as a young adult. Because as mysterious as the universe is in many ways, there is an order to it, there is a precision to it that finally convinced me that it couldn't have just come into being with nothing behind it. I came to the conclusion that there must have been some sort of sentient, some sort of creative force behind the universe that early stirring eventually led me to believe in God. That's not enough evidence for a lot of people. I understand that. But for me, the very nature of the universe was and still is compelling evidence of the existence of God. The universe still fascinates me when I sometimes take a few minutes outside after dark, especially if I've just come home it's late at night and I'm walking from the garage into the house and I look up in the sky and you can see so many lights up there. It delights me actually that Hannah has taken an interest in the night sky as well. So sometimes if we're walking together after dark, she'll point things out to me. Look, Dad, there's the dipper. And Look, Dad, there's a big star up there, the evening star. And I keep trying to explain to her the evening star is actually Jupiter. It's a planet, which I think she gets, but she still calls it a star. It's nice to have been able to at least pass on some of that interest to her. And sometimes she points things out to me that I actually hadn't noticed before. I think it's a little bit like the earliest humans, because I suspect humans from the very earliest times have been transfixed by those lights up in the sky, staring at them, wondering what they point to. It's a vast, vast universe that we're a part of. Space is incomprehensibly large. I was reading not too long ago that astronomers had recently discovered the most distant galaxy known to us. They found it using the Hubble telescope that just happened to be pointed in the right direction. They have named the galaxy Abel 2744Y1 because astronomers are romantics. So. That's what they've named it, Abel 2744Y1. And it is about 13.7 billion light years from the Earth. 13.7 billion light years from the Earth. At least that's the estimate. I don't know exactly how they estimate these things, but that's what they've estimated. That means that the light from that distant galaxy has traveled 13.7 billion years before it can be seen here on Earth. And yet it can be seen after all that time and after all that distance. It seems that light never dies. It's always there. We can make the conscious decision not to look at the night sky and not to see it, we can allow the artificial lights of the big city to drown out the lights of the night sky, but the light is still there. We just have to open our eyes and be able to see it. Astronomers tell us that the light from that distant galaxy is the oldest thing we can possibly see. To look at it is not only to look 13.7 billion light years into space, it's to look 13.7 billion years back in time. Isn't that an awesome thought? 
to a point, we're told, when the universe was in its infancy. When creation was, in cosmic terms, perhaps just a fraction of a second old. Just moments after the beginning of both time and space. In a way, you might say that looking at that galaxy is a little bit like looking at the earliest work of God whose first act of creation, according to the account of creation in the book of Genesis, was to say, let there be light. And who knows, perhaps it was the light of that distant galaxy recently discovered that popped into being all of a sudden. And as we look at it, as we see that light, we almost see eternity. Almost, but not quite. Because the light of that galaxy was not the first light that existed. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. And Jesus is a light more powerful than even the light of the most distant galaxy that can travel through the vastness of space for 13.7 billion years and still be seen. Light can be dimmed. Light can be distorted. Sometimes darkness seems to win out. But light in some way, in some form, always continues to shine. And that's certainly the case with Jesus. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. Those words are included in a collection of sayings by Jesus that are called the I am sayings, in which Jesus declares himself to be many things. The living bread, from above, the door, the good shepherd, the true vine, the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection, and the life. Jesus declared himself to be all these things as well as the light of the world. The I am sayings declare the power of Jesus and they reveal to us the nature of Jesus. I am is traditionally seen as the name of God, taken from the story in the book of Exodus when Moses encounters the burning bush and God speaks to him from it and instructs him to go to the people and to speak for God. And Moses asks What's your name? Because the people are going to want to know what your name is. And God responds, I am that I am. Just tell the people that I am has sent you. I am. Two tiny little words that say a lot. The very nature of God is life. God is existence. To God, all things that exist owe their existence. And Jesus claims that name for himself. I am this. I am that. Maybe most powerfully, and a lot of people don't get this in John's Gospel. They think it's poor grammar, and it's not poor grammar. But there is a point in John's Gospel when Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees and the Pharisees say, what are you talking about? Are you saying that you're older than our father Abraham? And Jesus' reply is not grammatically incorrect. Jesus is making a point. He replies to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is saying something very powerful by repeatedly using those words and applying them to himself. He's making a powerful statement of his oneness with the divine, of his unity with God. And that helps us understand perhaps what Jesus meant when he said, I am the light of the world. What is light in a spiritual sense? Well, light is that which reveals God to us, most simply. Light is that which gives us knowledge of God. Light is that which makes us aware of the presence of God. And Jesus did that, which is why one of the names that we use for Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Jesus, we see God. 
in the life of Jesus, we see a perfect human life lived and perfectly attuned to the will of God. The life of Jesus is a light that reveals to us who God is and what God wants us to be. And without that light, we would find ourselves consumed by darkness, lost, unable to find our way. But that light is there, always there, to nourish our spirits and to keep us close to God because Jesus is the light of the world. But Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. Is Jesus really still with us? Is Jesus really still the light of the world? Because let's be honest, the world can seem to be a very dark place at times, can't it? And yet, still that light shines. I want to take a detour for a moment into the other Gospels. And in the other Gospels, we find another I am statement by Jesus. Gathered together with his disciples, and this is about in the middle of each of the other three Gospels, so it's kind of the hub of the other three Gospels. Jesus gathers with his disciples who have already seen him do great and miraculous things, and Jesus finally looks at them and he challenges them with a question. Who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? There's those two tiny words again. And the disciples, they hemmed, they hawed. They knew there was a lot of talk going on about Jesus. They probably kind of knew where Jesus was going with the question. But they weren't too sure, so you catch a bit of hesitance in their voice. Well, Jesus, some say you're John the Baptist. Um, few people say you're Elijah. Um, some just think you're maybe one of the prophets. You know, not, they don't want to say too much. And you kind of get the impression that Jesus gets frustrated a little bit and he finally challenges them directly. What about you, he says. You're the ones who have been with me all this time. You're the ones who have seen everything I have done. What about you? Who do you say that I am? I am. There's those two tiny words again. Who do you say that I am? And finally, maybe not surprisingly, because he was often the first one to jump, it's Peter who chose to open his eyes to the light right in front of him. And Peter boldly said, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Peter finally understood the almost impossibly intimate relationship between the Father and the Son, between God and Jesus. Maybe it was here, maybe it was that moment when the movement that would become the church was fully born. The first real confession of faith about Jesus. You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. You are the Messiah. All because light finally shone through to Peter at that moment. But some would say that was then. This is now. Jesus is dead, some would say. Jesus is gone, some would say. Some would even have us believe that Jesus never existed at all. I wonder if the light that's right in front of us has been obscured by the interminable debates and discussions of those who know a lot about Jesus but don't know what to make of him, just like the people who Jesus asked his disciples about 2,000 years ago had found the light of Jesus obscured by those interminable debates about who he was, people who had encountered him but didn't know what to make of him. My faith guides me in this. Do I still see light shining 
Do I still see the light of Christ? Do I still see the light of God? Is Jesus still as much the light of the world today as he was 2,000 years ago? And I say yes. I say he is. Because I still see lives being changed by Jesus. I still see people being transformed by Jesus. I still see the poor being cared for in Jesus' name and the outcast being made insiders in Jesus' name. At the very least, I see it at the best of times. I see it when the church is really being the church. We don't always do that perfectly because we're human. But at the best of times when the church is the church, I see those things happening. Doesn't always happen. Because as with all light, the light of Jesus can be obscured by all the false gods that are around us. And there are a lot of them. Money that tells me that it's all about what I can get. All about me. Power that tells me that I'm allowed to use people as much as I want. Sex that tells me that whatever feels good must be good. The entertainment industry that tells me that if I'm not beautiful, I'm worthless. Fear that too easily leads to hatred. These things... And so many more. These things are so prevalent in our society. And yes, they can obscure the light of Jesus. And yes, they blind some people to the light of Jesus. But it doesn't stop the light of Jesus from shining. Hebrews 13 verse 8 tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's another way of saying that Jesus Christ is I am. That Jesus Christ is the eternal one. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he didn't just mean for that one moment in time 2,000 years ago. He was making a statement of his eternal nature. Because that light does not stop shining. Oh, we may choose not to see it. Or we may let it be dimmed by all the things that can so easily dazzle us. But just as the light from a galaxy 13.7 billion years away from us can still be seen, so is the eternal light of Jesus still present with us. Because after all, Jesus said, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. But let's remember this, when we get a sense that the light is being dimmed, that darkness is starting to win the battle. Let's remember this. Jesus said not only, I am the light of the world, he also said to his disciples, including us, you, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. I've read that vision is a strange thing, that we don't really see any of the things that we think we see, that what we see, what our brain is actually interpreting, is the light being reflected off the things that are in front of us. Well, the light of Jesus is a little bit like that. It's still shining for all the world to see today, but it's being reflected off we who claim to be his disciples. We keep the light of Jesus shining. And the light of Jesus does shine. We see it when we see acts of compassion being extended to those whom society deems unworthy of compassion. We still see the light of Jesus shining when we see love being offered in situations where hate would be easier. We still see the light of Jesus shining when we see not judgment being offered against people, but the grace of God being extended always to the other. Because it was always others that Jesus was concerned with. The feeding of the poor, the empowerment of the marginalized, the welcoming of the outcast, a talk with a Samaritan woman. In all these ways, Jesus taught us not only how to be his body and to do his ministry, but also how to shine with his light and how to ensure that his light would remain the light of the world. And that light of the world, in fact, is still there, even though sometimes it may be dimmed 
are some of the things that even threaten at times to drown it out. But it will never be drowned out. Jesus is the light of the world. Yesterday, today, and forever. And for now, his light shines through us, through you, through me, through those who dare to call themselves disciples of Jesus. May we, as his church, may we, as his body, shine brightly with his life day after day after day. And let us pray. Eternal God, indeed, have us be lights, shining so brightly that others will be drawn not to us, but to Jesus. O oh God, use us as you will. Take us into the darkest corners that exist and let us be light to those who need it. For we ask it. In Jesus' holy name, amen.